Hey, good morning, everyone. It's been a while since our last class, so welcome back. Um, before I get started, one of my special little girl that's here with me, my oldest granddaughter, Musya. <laughs> Come to say hello. And Musya's on her way to camp, so she's staying by her bubby until I take her to the bus. Okay, and now we're going to get started. So, Musya, you gave Tzedakah ready this morning? Okay, so everyone, please give Tzedakah. Yidel Tzedakah from the Kareva Sasaka And if you want to put down in the chat anyone that needs to heal him, feel free to do so. We will say chapter Chaf and Musya's Davening, so Musya, you'll also have in mind anyone who needs a Fuhu Shalema. Lam Ratzach, Mizmar David, Yancha, Dinar, Biyom Tzara. Yisagef Hashem, Elohei Yaakov. Yishlach Ezra Chami Kodesh, Umitzian Yisadeka. Yiskar Kol Mechosecha Valascha, Yidash Nesela. Yitain Lecha Chavavecha Vachol Atzascha Yimale, Nirana Beshu Asecha, Vashem Eloheni Nikol. Yimale Adinai Kol Mashal Asecha. Ata Yidati Ki Yoshi Adinai Mishicho, Yanei Mishbe Kotcha Bidvuros Yesha Yimina. Ela Varecha Veela Vasus and Vanachan Beshem Adinai, Eloheni Unaskir. Hem Akor Venafol Vanachan Kamna Venisodad. Adonai Hoshia Hamelech Hanenu Yom Karenu. And today's learning and davening is in the merit of Rafu Shlema for Yitzchak ben Esther Malka and Devora Bas Rezla, Rachel Bas Vega. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning, Helga. Good morning, Lynn. Good morning, Becky in Israel. Wonderful Rafu Shlema for Yitzchak ben Esther Malkalea. So we should only have Surah Tavot. And uh, for those of you who didn't see my special guest today, this is my precious granddaughter, Musya. Musya's here for, uh, on her way to camp. So she's staying at her bubby's house, and we will take her to the buses right after the class. Okay, so we are in the middle, if you remember, we are in the middle of a lesson that we took from something called the Sheish, a prayer called the Sheish Zechirot. It's right after Shacharist Davening. I know it's in Chabad Sidurim. I'm not sure if it's in others as well, if you know. But um, the importance of these six Zechirot uh, were handed down to us based on our tradition. We have mentioned six different times of things that Jews have to remember every single day. So not just, oh, when we get to Purim, we remember what happened with Haman. Or we get to the part of Hanukkah. No. In Jewish law and in Jewish tradition, we remember things on a daily, daily schedule. And the reason for that is, is because when you have a strong sense of memory for important moments in history or very, very crucial junctures of our peoplehood, these lessons really keep you going throughout your day, throughout your week. It's not just, oh, yeah, I remember on Purim, I remember about Amalek, I remember about Haman, so now I'm going to give Shalach Manis. That's not what it is. We have to remember our daily, our daily schedule has to be infused with occurrences that happened to our people in the past. And I, I find that very powerful because it really makes us a very mindful people. And it really makes every part of our day and all our interactions very meaningful because we're not just a random human being living here in whether it's you know Canada or Israel or the States. We are a people that have a very, very strong, long history. And our past plays very, very, very much into the present. So I'm just going to welcome Sharon. Welcome, welcome Corinne. Good to see you. Hello, Carol. Good morning, Sapora. Good morning, Arlene. Um, so I didn't ask everyone, how are you doing? Before we get started, how are you feeling now in Toronto? This gorgeous, beautiful weather, spectacular <coughs> season. Uh, give me a thumbs up how you're feeling, because I need to know the crowd, the mood everyone's in. Give me a little glimpse of what mood you're in as we get on with our class today. Okay? You could put an emoji, a smile. A happy face, right? Musi is feeling very excited. She's going to camp. How are you feeling? I see him a few thumbs up. Um, yeah, I'm seeing some, a lot of, okay, so people are feeling really good, which is very different when we give our classes in January, February, March. Okay. Okay, we're all good. Okay, so we're up to the fourth 
remembrance. And I'm going to throw it out there before I give you what my um, research has taken me. The fourth memory that we have to infuse in our day every day is the Egel HaZahav. If you know what that means, put it down in the comments. What does Egel HaZahav mean? And the question I am putting out to you is, why do we have to remember the Egel HaZahav every single day? Okay, I'll give you two seconds to put it in the chat. What does Egel HaZahav mean? Ah, okay, Masih said the golden calf. The Egel HaZahav, we have to remember the golden calf and how we provoked God. Okay? That we were sort of being, I would say, maybe dishonest in our relationship when it came to our relationship between us and God. We know that the given, you must feel you want to go inside now because the class is more like the You mind? Yeah? Okay, thank you, sir. Afterwards, you come out. That way. Okay. Um, we speak a lot about, in a relationship, we talk a lot about infidelity. Right? We talk about how a marriage gives us an opportunity to be absolutely honest, integral, and focused on one person. That spouse that we married. We made that commitment. Right? This week, we went to two, well, this week, our community celebrated two beautiful weddings two young women who have found their path back to judaism one of them with her family one of them on her own and then her family followed and they made a very strong commitment under the chuppah um, as observant women and they took this mitzvah very 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 serious what does this mitzvah mean absolute honesty and fidelity in your relationship and, you know, sometimes we think, like, don't include me in this conversation of infidelity. It's not my style. It's not my problem. I'll never get there. It it's almost has nothing to do with me. I'm such an honest person. I love my spouse so much. Yeah, we have hard days here and there, but like, infidelity is out of the question. So this fourth remembrance brings it down to a level that maybe some of us haven't really thought about, but it might give us some food for thought. My husband's standing in Sobeys, and it was Erev Shabbat, and he was he usually does the shopping for me. He was picking up the groceries. There was a woman in front of him who put in her bank card, and it declined. So she took out another card. It declined. After her third attempt, she was so embarrassed that she turned around and behind her was my husband and a few other customers. As you know, Erev Shabbat, what the supermarkets look like. And she gives this look of disgust. And she goes, oh, my husband, he knows I go shopping on Friday. Why wouldn't he put money into the bank? What a loser. My husband felt absolutely so uncomfortable he turned away didn't even want to acknowledge it because at that moment my friends this woman did something that I would term being dishonest and actually I would use the term infidelity in her behavior now you could say oh Goldie that's extreme that's extreme and that's not true but think about it when a man and woman are under the chuppah, and the woman goes around seven times, we know there are many, many Kabbalistic reasons for her going around, but one of the beautiful um, explanations that I've heard was going around seven times is building that wall, building the wall of her home. And when she finishes building the wall and building that wall, she steps in to that home, her and her husband exclusively. And they make a strong straight statement, him to her and her to him. And they say, we have lots of family and friends, business associates, community. We have all these people. However, our responsibility is to each other first and exclusively to each other. Which means that when this woman turned around and fluttered her eyebrows, her eyelashes, 
and made a smirk and a very, very humiliating remark against her husband, who my husband doesn't even know who it is. But the fact that she did that meant that she walked out of the circle. That's a cheat. And you might say, Goldie, stop being ridiculous. Everyone does this. Because everyone does this doesn't mean it's okay. We've learned from our past. What everyone does is not usually right. We as Jewish people have to stand above and different. Just because everybody flutters their eyelashes and makes smirks and rolls their eyes about her spouse, makes a joke, doesn't mean it's right. At that moment, she left the circle. And I want to take it one more level. I don't know how many of you work out of the home, work in offices where there are people from different genders. But this comes up many times. I know it came up for me when I was at work in New York City as a young single girl. We're working in an office, and sometimes you might be left alone in the office with someone of the opposite gender. Do you know what the laws of our Torah extrapolate about this occurrence? When a man and a woman are alone in a room and there's no one else in the home, no one else in the building, no one else nearby, there's something that's called at that moment that's taking place. If you know the answer, please put it in the comments. Please put it in the comments. Anybody? That moment when a man and a woman who are not married and are not related are in an environment alone, that is called the laws of Yichud. Y-I-C-H-U-D. Or in Hebrew, it's Yud Ches Vav Dalid. The laws of Yichud are very, very, very clear in the Torah. A man and a woman who are not married to each other may not be alone in a room or an office if there are other people that are not going to be walking in and out. Now, I know there are many people that will say to me, Goldie, this is the most outrageous and old-fashioned law ever. This makes no sense. It's not practical. And for those of us who work in office buildings or we work late at night, listen, sometimes we're in an environment where we're left alone with a co-worker. So he's a man, I'm a woman. I'm happily married. The Torah tells us something very powerful. Even if there's a slight chance that one or the other will cross the boundary and start a relationship which is deceiving to their spouse and against halacha, that means that they have crossed the boundaries of yichud. And the Torah says that is a no-no. And even if so many people will say, I have been in situations like this and it's never been a problem, the Jews as a whole took this mitzvah upon themselves and said, it is inconvenient, it is a pain in the neck, it is very, very, you know, challenging for a business. You know, however, if it can save somebody's marriage, we as Jews are taking upon ourselves to keep the laws of Yechud. Now, before I go on, I want to hear from you. Do you think this makes any sense to you, this law? Because I want to bring on some very interesting examples that will back my case. Okay? So I'm going to give a few seconds. Do you think that this laws of Yechud Makes sense. You think they're old fashioned. You think they're bright on the mark. You think it's uh, something that you can see really uh, saving marriages. I don't know. What do you think? Put it down in the comments. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning, Bernice. Good morning, Corinne. Okay, so Becky says. In her office, they open the door. So you think that this is an important mitzvah and it's something that should be upheld and it should be something that every everyone should keep in their business environments, in their office environments. Anybody else besides Becky have an opinion on this? I'd like to just take a little survey out there. You give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Do you think this is a mitzvah that's smart, intuitive, old fashioned, unnecessary? Brilliant. Here, so we put in the comments.
Anyone? Anyone has an opinion on this? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> okay. Um, I believe it should always be upheld. Carol, Carol. Mm -hmm. I guess you're out in the workforce and you see that there's a big value to this. Okay. Excellent. Maybe there should be, maybe there would be less divorces. Aha. Because if everybody kept the laws of Yichud, it would prevent, prevent any possibility of an affair. Because affair is only take place when two people of opposite sex are in a room alone. When a bunch of people are sitting in a room, you can't really have an affair. So you're on the button, Bernice. Good morning, Denise. Anybody else have uh, an opinion here? Yeah, I think Bernice is right on the button. Okay, so the truth of the matter is, there's a pasuk in the Talmud that goes like this, and you can tell me if you've ever heard it before. Ein apotropos la arroyos. Ein apotropos la arroyos. Which means that no one is exempt from the challenges of sexuality. No one. Not the greatest rabbi, not the greatest tzaddik, not the greatest pope. No one. Sarah says nothing in the Torah is unnecessary. While being once a few minutes alone with someone leads to nothing, but being a full day alone with someone with whom you share a lot of interest could eventually lead to something. Sarah, you're on the button. You're on the button. <clears throat> if the Torah gives us a commandment, it's because God knows the human condition. He created us. He's our creator. He knows exactly what makes us tick. He knows what makes us strong. He knows what causes us to be weak. And especially in this arena of sexuality, the Talmud says this pasuk, Ein apatropos laaroyes, that no one is exempt. And it's followed by a story in the Talmud that will blow you away. It's a little humiliating. But there's actually a 80-year-old Tana. A Tana was a great tzaddik or a rabbi in the days of the Talmud. And the story took place with an 80-year-old Tana. And the story is there for eternity. So imagine the lesson that, I guess, those who wrote the Talmud felt that we need to see the story. There was a great Tana who was asked to do the mitzvah of Pidyan Shavuyim. Pidyan Shavuyim was a very popular mitzvah in those days and for many years thereafter, releasing captives. Unfortunately, when there were Jewish boys and girls that were taken into captivity, there's a big mitzvah called Pidyan Shavuyim. If you've ever heard this mitzvah, you can give me um, a thumbs up. It's one of the commandments in the Torah, one of our 613. And we as Jews have to collect sometimes large, enormous amounts of money to release captives so that they shouldn't be sold into slavery and the Jewish community would pay this money, pay the ransom, take them out and adopt these people into the community. This Tana was given an opportunity to ransom a bus, a, a bus, a boat load of young women. They were being taken into captive, God forbid they could have become prostitutes and been taken advantage of and so he raised money in his community and saved all the girls he brought them into his home and because of this mitzvah of Yechud he put them on the top floor of his home which had a ladder to reach that floor and to be safe that nobody should got to be, go up to the floor with the girls he took the ladder away he had a student, they moved the ladder away. It's an 80-year-old Talmud Chacham. Moved it away, and the girls went to sleep for the night. In the middle of the night, the story goes, the Tana had a little bit of a feeling of going to see what's going on upstairs. And he himself, with his own effort and strength, moved the ladder all the way to this section and he attempted to climb the ladder and while he was halfway up the ladder he started to scream fire fire everyone woke up they saw this old man walking up the ladder an 80 year old man walking up the ladder 
and there was clearly no fire. The student approached the Tana and he said, what are you doing? He says, this is what I understand now, the brilliance of the mitzvah of Yechud. He says, I am an old man, but I too have a Yetzirah. I also have feelings. Feelings against the opposite sex is natural and normal and perfect. God gave us the feelings to be attracted to the opposite gender. That is normal and healthy and wonderful, if it's appropriate. He says, the feelings started to build up on me, so much so that as an older man, I moved the ladder myself. But halfway up, I realized, oh my God, what am I doing? What am I doing? And in order to prevent this from happening again, I'm ready to embarrass myself in public to wake you all up so you'll see how strong is this mitzvah. This story was written for eternity in the Talmud. Tell me what you think of this story, guys. What do you think of the story? There's a few takeaways from me, but what's your takeaway? Because I feel like we have to be very, very aware and we can't be holier than thou when we think, this isn't an issue for me. I'm a committed person. I'm a religious person. I'm the boss of this company. I'm happily married. Why would this be an issue? If an 80-year-old tzaddik can prove that he, too, has feelings, then we are in denial if we say we don't. That's what I love about the Torah, by the way. I love how the Torah is so true and so real. This can happen to anyone, exactly, Bernice. But the Torah is so practical. Who out there is holy enough to say, this, this mitzvah, it's not for me. I'm exempt. I'm strong. I'm committed. I'm smart. I'm powerful. I'm holy. I'm righteous. No. No, no, no. When God says there's a mitzvah of yichud, and it's something that we have to remember every single day. And we learn this when Hashem says, remember what you did to the Egel HaZahab. Moses was gone was one extra day. The Jews had miscalculated. They thought he was coming down. One extra day and they already cheated on God. So cheating is a real thing. Let's not be in denial. Let's be realistic. That's why, by the way, Jews don't have nuns and popes and priests. We have marriages, we get married, we focus a lot on our relationships, so much so we have the mitzvahs of mikvah, where this is a mitzvah that enhances our marriages. It's a mitzvah that makes sure that we are always excited, looking forward, with wonder and joy and surprise in our relationships. We never, ever get dull in our relationships because mitzvah, mikvah doesn't allow that, right? You only have two weeks together and two weeks off. So as Esther Perel says in her famous book, da Dating in Captivity, this is the secret to success. Forgot to tell you, Esther, that this has already been written in the Torah way before you were even born. But nevertheless, her book is out there and people realize this is powerful. And this mitzvah of mikvah really enhances what we sometimes can take for granted. Even thinking about the way we dress, you know, if you notice, I'm always dressed modest, okay? The reason why I dress modest is because the Torah gives us laws of modesty similar to the laws of how we take care of our Torah or how a Jewish body is supposed to be attractive. We're not denying attraction. Attractive, but still the modesty. And we share our bodies with our spouse very exclusive. We're very careful with how we allow ourselves to be promoted out there. We still look attractive. We still look good. We still take care of ourselves. However, the privacy of our body is exclusive to our spouse and our spouse only. And that's another thing in the Torah. We don't flaunt ourselves to make it ourselves a prov provocation for others because this is a world Let's not be in denial. This is a world where the flesh and the body are very, very attractive. But if we keep it exclusive in our marriage, 
that also encompasses the laws of Yechad. And it's tough out there. It's tough because, as I said, the flesh sells and people want to look attractive and women want to make sure that they're noticed. I feel that I don't need to be noticed for my body. I want to be noticed for my deeds, my kindness, my mitzvahs, perhaps my brains, <laughs> my ability to connect to people, my compassion. That's how I want to be noticed. And this is, this is also controversial. But still, the conversation has to happen. We cannot put it under the carpet and pretend it's not happening. Okay, so that's the fourth one of the six who remembers this. Good morning, Sharon, all the way from Israel. Sharon's an old friend of mine. Our, her daughter was in my school. I don't know how old your daughter is now, Sharon, but she's probably a mom by now. I could just imagine that. So we have Miriam. Remember what Miriam did. Miriam spoke negatively against Moshe. How many of you remember that? And the Rashi explains that she wasn't speaking negatively. She was just concerned. Oh, hi, Esther. Good morning. Moshe had been separated from his wife because he would just receive the Torah and God told him in order to be able to be, go up to the mountain, to be seen and to be spoken to by God, he had to separate from relations at that time. And Miriam and Aaron spoke concerned about the relationship and they were speaking negatively. Also coined as, wow, 31, unbelievable. Same age as my Mati, I think. Um, sorry, <laughs> I get distracted. Um, so Miriam was punished for saying negative words about Moshe. She contracted leprosy and she had to stay, Lush and Hora, she had to stay outside of the camp for seven days. And the camp waited for her for seven days, but nevertheless, she had to stay outside of the camp. What did she do? She voiced a very, very valid concern to her brother about her brother Moshe. Like, what's going on with that Mo brother Moshe's marriage? Right? Big sisters worry. But Hashem coined that as Lashon Hara. That's right. And for that reason, she had to be outside the camp for seven days. But let me ask you, my friends, what does Lashon Hara mean? How many times have we sat around the table? And I think we could talk about this for hours. How many times have we sat around the table with friends who've said things like, did you hear about so-and-so? <gasps> okay, I shouldn't tell you. It's lush. I'm just going to say it because, but it's lush. But it's not really lush. I, I, you know, it's not really lush. I'm, it, it's what we say here could really help her. I'm just going to say it. Now, that's lush and her. And we all know when we're saying lush and her. But it's juicy. And it's delicious. And it'll give our conversation really some more fuel. So just for one second, say a little Lashnara. How many of you have been in that situation where you've been sitting around and someone said Lashnara and it's very hard to stop it? And if you're the one that says, oh, I don't want to talk Lashnara, what do the friends say to you? <laughs> How do you come across? Is that, oh, you're the Tzadikis? Oh, you think you're so righteous? Nobody wants to be the one to stop Lashnara. But we all know when we listen to it, it doesn't feel good. It's a very, very uncomfortable feeling. You know you're listening to something not good, and nevertheless, it's hard to stop it. So one of our classes at Shul, the women, we were talking about different ways you can stop Lashon Hara. And someone said, you could change the subject. Someone else said, you could just stand up and say, oh, I forgot, I got to go do something. And everyone gets the message. Someone else, you know, so it's about learning how to stop the conversation without saying, oh, I don't talk Lashon Hara. You could be very, very, you know, um, you know, kind, considerate, appropriate, but still change the subject. Has have any of you have any successes? Please put it down in the comments for all of us. I got, I got a beautiful put on the table thing from Chafet Simon. says no Lashon Hara. I don't say it. The thing with the roses does. <gasps> You have a beautiful pot on the table. Is that what you're saying, Sarah? You have a beautiful pot on the table that says, No Lashon Hara. <gasps> wow. 
That is brilliant. So you never have to say it because the roses do. I love it. And my question, sorry, is does it work? But do people notice it? Do you have to just go <clears throat> point to it or it's obvious? Lashon Hara, by the way, is not just talking about others. It's even talking about your spouse. And the Rebbe would say talking about yourself. You know, we're not allowed to talk Lashon Hara about ourselves, which means we're not allowed to put ourselves down. Sarah says it works. Wow. Please put down in the comments where you picked up this pot. I love it. I just love it. So we're not allowed to talk less than her about ourselves. So we can't say like, oh, I'm such a klutz. I always burn my meal. Or I'm so forgetful. I'm You can't rely on me. You know what Jews are not allowed to talk less than her about themselves? Number one. Number two. We're clearly not, not allowed to talk about Lashonar about our spouse. You could say, but it's my spouse. We're one person. Yeah, what did I just say? You're not allowed to talk Lashonar about yourself. You clearly cannot talk Lashonar about your spouse. And that, my friends, amongst women, is something I think all of us watching right now, we have to take a stand. No more women sitting around coffee or tea or going out together and saying things negatively about our spouse. Like, oh, you think your husband's a klutz? You should see what my husband did. Wrong. So wrong. There's nothing attractive, classy, loving, or perfect about it. It is horrendous for a marriage. There was a man that was at work and overheard two co-workers repeating a story about him and his wife that clearly his wife must have shared with the friends or it must have shared that someone else didn't realize he, it was his story. And two women were talking Lashnahara. The humiliation for the spouse is devastating. How could we be so, so ununderstanding and so cheating on our relationship? Lashnahara is such a huge no-no. You know, even the Rebbe was so careful with the words he used. He never said the word deadline. He said due date. Because deadline has a negative word. We talk about Lashon Hara, bad language, right? The Rebbe never used the word retreat. For a convention, the Rebbe never liked the word retreat. The Rebbe used the word, like to use Shabbaton, or convention, or gathering. Retreat means to go back, has a negative connotation. Even the words traif, the Rebbe never used the word traif. The Rebbe used the word non kosher. Think about the holiness of the Rebbe's tongue and how we can emulate our Rebbe. You know, Gimel Thomas was just this week on Thursday. And all I think about is the Rebbe's lifestyle and the Rebbe's legacy. The things that we can learn from our Rebbe in every little detail. There was a story, and I'm gonna conclude in, with this story. We'll pick up again next week. There was a story of a home during the days of the Baal Shem. Not to confuse with the Baal Shem Tov, but the Baal Shem, Tov, but the Baal Shem was a, a great leader, a great rabbi in, uh, I think in the early 1800s. And in his community, there was a home that seemed to have been condemned. People who moved into the house would leave after a couple of days saying it was a haunted home. There was definitely sounds, screams, ghosts. It made no sense to them, but they couldn't live there. And week after week, this house was for sale. And everyone thought they could buy the house for cheap and redo it and move in. And one after another, they moved out of the house. So somebody approached Rabbi Baal Shem and they said, you know, what do you think we can do about this? You're a Baal Shem. <coughs> he said, I have an idea. He took his whole yeshiva of students and they settled in this home for a couple of weeks and studied Torah day and night. After a few weeks, he said, the house is good, you can move in. And the next lucky owner bought the house and they moved in and things were then on were fine. So people approached Rabbi Yol Baal Shem and they said, what happened in that house? How did you get rid of these 
screeching, horrendous screams and voices. He says, and only a tzaddik knows this, he says, there was a couple that lived here in this home that they used to scream at each other negative words, derogatory words, curses. And you and I both know that this goes on in homes. We know. We know. We know too well what kind of language is spoken between husbands and wives, behind closed doors, and between children and their parents. It's devastating. It's devastating. He says this home was full of it. So much so that when they left, they left the tumma. They left the impurities and the negative speech was left in the home. And by us sitting and learning Torah, we eradicated and moved out these terrible sounds and now the house is clear once again. My friends, we know that Chaim v'mavis b'yad halashan. Life and death is on the tongue. I like this. Sarah says, I think I shared on your Facebook page. It could be ordered for free. Wow, please everyone take a note of this. Once can leave seven days a week on the table. Since the whole week. That's beautiful. Thank you so so much, Sarah, for sharing that. I will definitely look into it and make the order. Shabbos table at powerofspeech.org. Beautiful. Chayim the mothers be at Alashan. Life and death lie on our tongue. It's all in our words. And my dear friends, as women, we have the power to set the tone in the home. We are the ones that will set the direction of the language, the words that are used. All we have to do when someone says something negative at home, we go, uh-oh, not in this house. Or like, oh, in our house, really? Those are the words I want to bring into my home? We talk about, you know, feng shui, that everything in the home we want to have with the right colors and the right sense and the right direction and the windows and the doors because we want to bring in good energy. Good energy starts with good speech. Say nice words in your home. Don't need any negative words in the home. People are going to want to come to your home. They're going to want to hang out at your house. They won't be able to sense it really, but there's something magical about a home that doesn't talk Russian horror, that doesn't shout and curse and talk negativity. Even words like, you're such a bad boy. Yeah, sometimes children need to be reprimanded, but you could say things like, really? Is that what you just did? A boy like you? My precious boy that has such a yetzer tov? No. You have a piece of Hashem in you. How could you say that? Oh, you're not the kind of kid that does those things. No, Hashem expects more of you or... I expect more of you, right? Those things elevate our family. We can give tremendous amount of direction and constructive criticism if everyone's into that. It can be done with positive speech. So remember, I think it was Mark Twain that said, I could live on one compliment for a month. Let's try complimenting, using positive words, using words of reinforcement, words of praise. I wish you a fantastic week take care. Next week, I'll be speaking to you live from LA. So stay tuned. 9.45 your time. Oh my gosh! 6.45 a.m. I will be up next week. I won't miss you out. Take care. Have a great week.